Good evening. Welcome to worship this evening. We're going to continue on our journey following Jesus in these places of the Passion. And tonight, you can see on our screen, we're going to the high priest courtyard, which is at the time of Jesus would have been Caiaphas. So let's preview the courtyard. On the eastern slope of Mount Zion, just outside the old city of Jerusalem, sits a church called St. Peter in Galicantu. The ruins here, both beneath the church and in the courtyard, are unspeakably significant. For this is thought to be the quarters of the high priest. In Jesus' time, this would have been a man named Caiaphas who was instrumental in the strategy to remove Jesus from public life. A Byzantine chapel was first erected here in the 400s. It was destroyed in the Arab conquest of 1010, rebuilt in the Crusades in 1102, and once again fell into ruin when Jerusalem again changed hands. The church of St. Peter in Galicantu that now occupies this space was built in the 1930s. Galicantu in Latin means the rooster's crow, making it obvious why this place holds significance in the story of Jesus' final days. When Jesus was led away from the Garden of Gethsemane in chains, he would have been taken from the Mount of Olives down through the Kidron Valley and back toward the city to the high priest's complex. These ancient stairs are part of the path that led up from the Kidron Valley and are quite likely stairs that Jesus, bound and scuffled, would have climbed to face the accusations that were being constructed against him. Here, Jesus would listen to all manner of testimony against him. He would be smacked around, spit upon and ultimately called a blasphemer. The lower crypts from the time of Jesus still exist below ground. It is likely that Jesus was held a prisoner in the darkness here, knowing that his suffering was upon him. Meanwhile, just outside the walls, close enough perhaps for Jesus to hear the commotion in the courtyard, was a very frightened Peter, who three times denied that he even knew Jesus. The church of St. Peter in Galicantu is a stark and sobering place, as one walks in the footsteps of Jesus. It forces us to come face to face with the very human suffering that the Savior endured, while confronting us with the ways in which we have also denied Jesus. That site is a fantastic, beautiful church. Um, but when you go down below in the caverns, it was a cistern where they uh, would have held Jesus or uh, where they held prisoners, people that came against Caiaphas, the high priest, when they would take him down below. And they had actually the shackles on the wall where they would shackle him to the wall. And just how stark difference that was from this beautiful church above to what Jesus was held below ground in this dark old cave. And so tonight we're going to focus on Peter and what he did this night. Told him Jesus that he would never leave him, and in short order he does. So let's begin our worship with our first hymn.
I invite you to rise as you're able. We begin our worship this evening in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us ever walk with Jesus to see the depths of His love, to behold the gift of His forgiveness, to gaze upon the heights of His grace, to marvel at the magnitude of His mercy. We follow Christ to the courtyard. It belongs to the high priest Caiaphas, but Peter is there, and so are others. Peter denies Jesus three times, but all is not lost. After his collapse, God's grace is amazing. Faithful Lord, with me abide. I shall follow where you guide. Gracious and most merciful Father, in the light of your holiness, I see myself as I really am, and I am guilty. I confess that I have impure thoughts and unclean lips. I think too highly of myself and too little of others. I cling too tightly to the treasures of this world, that I cannot open my hands to receive blessings from you. My feet walk in the path of sin. I wander astray and become a stranger of righteousness. Forgive me and set me again on the path that leads to life. Deal with me not as I deserve, but according to your mercy. Not because I am worthy, but because you are gracious. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Hear the good news. Jesus walked to places of rejection, suffering, torment, and death for you. Jesus was determined to go to Gethsemane, to Gabbatha, to Golgotha for you. That's why Jesus forgives you completely and loves you eternally. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority alone, I therefore forgive all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Merciful and mighty Father, Like Peter, we can make great boasts. Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. When we fail and fall and get lost in guilt, restore to us the joy of your salvation. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our epistle reading this evening comes from Isaiah chapter 53. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. 
yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading is from James chapter 2. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the law, the whole law, but fails at one point has become guilty of it all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I ask you to please rise your table for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 26th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to evoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. This is the Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Let us pray. Lord, I ask that you speak through me this evening. Lord, may the words that come from my mouth give honor to you and your holy word. Let your word speak to us this Lent as we visit the places of the passion of our Savior. I ask all of this day of our crucified Savior who died and rose for our sins. Amen. Good evening, friends. Good evening. Noel Coward, a famous British playwright, died back in 1973. But before he died, he once played a joke on 20 of the most famous men in London. He sent all 20 men an identical note that read, Everybody has found out what you've done. If I were you, I would get out of town. What did all 20 men do? They followed the letter, didn't they? They got out of town. What if you opened your mail one day and found such a note? Or, in today's world, I get a few emails like this every week. This one got Monday. It says, I'm presuming you are going to remember the man in this picture, and it's got a link for me to click to see those pictures. Well, by now I've gotten enough of these to know that this is just somebody wants to hack in my computer. It's got a virus, right? I know that those aren't pictures of me in that link. But even though we get emails like this all the time, When you get one, 
What thoughts go through your mind? Or maybe the first time you got one of these, did it make you stop and think? What pictures are they talking about? Or maybe you started to think about some of the things in your past that you've hidden. Maybe some of the income you hid from the IRS. Maybe some time at work you spent doing anything but work. Maybe you think about the expenses account that you kept inflating over and over to pad your salary. Or your deep secret that only you know about. You get this flood of guilt over you, don't you? Sometimes guilt can sit on your chest like a concrete block and make you sick. Maybe there's someone on the planet who hasn't known guilt. All this remorse, an ongoing note to themselves that says you're worthless, but I've yet to meet that person, have you? What sucked you under? A relationship? A fight? That moment in your life where you wish you could do it all over again. If I could take those words back, I would. Or maybe it's the guilt, or maybe the guilt isn't a result of a moment of your life, but maybe it's a season of your life. You failed as a parent. You squandered away some of your youth, or your money, or both. And you just had this overwhelming feeling of guilt. Well, today we walk to the courtyard in Jerusalem. The courtyard of the high priest. And the high priest that, was, that sat in that office at that time was Caiaphas. In Caiaphas's courtyard, we're going to see guilt. Peter's guilt and our own guilt. Beyond the courtyard, we see grace. Grace for Peter and grace for us. So let's get to the context. We have to rewind a little bit, go back in Scripture a little bit, and go back to Gethsemane. Matthew 26. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. You think about all the things that Peter and Jesus went through. Three years before this, Jesus was walking on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus sees Peter fishing with his brother Andrew calls them to follow him. I will make you fishers of men. And Peter and Andrew follow. Then about a year later, Peter follows Jesus out into the Sea of Galilee during a storm. Peter walks on the water, but when he begins to sink, Jesus immediately reaches out his hand, takes a hold of Peter, and saves him. At Caesarea Philippi, Peter says to Jesus, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. After that, Jesus takes Peter with him and James and John to see the glory of the transfiguration. Then Jesus invites the same trio to witness his agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. No wonder Peter makes the claim, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. But we've all made that claim in some sort of fashion, haven't we? Tonight is working with the compromands, and they're going to get up here and confirm their faith. They're going to say, answer the same question that we all did when we went through confirmation. Do you intend to live according to the Word of God and in faith, word, and deed, remain true to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even to death? And we each said, I do. When we get married, the pastor asked, will you take this man to be your wedded husband? And the women said, I do. Will you take this woman to be your wedded wife? The men say, I do. The claim. The claim part is easy, right? Living each day as a compromand or a husband or a wife, the one that we promised when we said I do, has its challenges to it. And when we get challenged in life, cracks start forming in our relationships. The cracks for Peter are about to be recorded for us all to see. As the events in the courtyard unfold, it's like watching the cracks in a house's foundation start slowly, and then they spread quickly. The servant girl comes up to Peter and says, You were with Jesus, the Galilean. Peter denies it, saying, 
I do not know what you mean. Peter then goes out to the courtyard entrance where another girl sees him. She says to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus the Nazarene. We, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter denies it. But this time with an oath. I don't know the man. The second crack. When there are enough cracks, there will always be a collapse. Always. And the collapse, after a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I don't know the man. We know from first century documents that the Jews in Galilee spoke a dialect of a different dialect of Aramaic. It's like living in the United States. You know when you're talking to somebody from the South, right? We're all speaking English, but they just talk a little different, don't they? Right? Peter's accent betrayed him. What does Peter do? He invokes a curse on himself. The word in Greek is anathema. From we get the English word anathematize. Anathematize means to be eternally condemned. That's what Peter's doing. Peter, Paul uses the same words in Galatians 1, 8, and 9. If you ever think about being a pastor, read this verse. I'm sorry. If anyone preaches a different gospel to you, let him be anathematized or eternally condemned. Peter would rather be condemned than to admit he knows Jesus. He's scared. He fears for his life. First, Peter becomes, he comes a denial. And then comes a direct denial, an oath. And then Peter comes a curse. And what's next? The rooster crows. Where Peter collapses and he weeps bitterly. Wept bitterly. For us too, it can happen when we say, maybe I'll just have one more drink. Or I'll tell just one more lie. Or I'll have just one more look on the internet. Crack after crack after crack. But one more leads to one more and just one more. And when there are enough cracks, there'll be a collapse, always. Then what? Guilt sets in. Why? Why do I continue to do the things I know I will feel guilty about later? What are our options? Can numb it? Numb it with... Binge drinking, binge shopping, binge internet games, binge eating, binge drinking, binge TV watching, you name it. You can deny it. You can pretend the rooster never crowed at all. Concoct a plan to cover it all up. But one lie leads to another lie, then to another lie. And before long, you have to adjust the second lie to align with the first lie. And then the third lie has to be changed to align with the second lie. My grandfather told me when he caught me in a lie, you're not smart enough to be a good liar. <laughs> Bury it. Bury your guilt beneath a mountain of work and a calendar of appointments. The busier we stay, the less time we have to spend with the one person that we've come to dislike the most. And that can be ourselves. We punish it. We cut ourselves. We flog ourselves. If it's not with whips and blades, then it's with rules. We create a long list of things to do. Pray more. Study more. Show up earlier. Stay up late. We can minimize it. We don't sin. We just lost our way. I don't sin. I just got caught up in the moment. I didn't sin. I just took the wrong path. We can re redirect it. We can lash out at our kids, lash out at our spouse, your coworkers, your cat, the dog, the driver in the next lane, whoever is in your way to take it, right? You can offset it. You could build the perfect family, create the perfect career, score perfect grades, and be completely intolerant of mistakes that you make or other people make. 
Guilt can turn us into miserable, weary, angry, deceitful, stressed out people. Guilt can suck the life right out of you. But grace restores it. Grace restores it. How does that happen? The confession. Peter went out and wept bitterly. Peter didn't numb his guilt. He didn't deny it. He didn't bury it. He didn't punish it. He didn't minimize it. He didn't redirect it. He didn't offset it. He confessed it. Period. While Peter's outside in the courtyard, weeping bitterly, Jesus is preparing to go to the cross to die. You see, Jesus doesn't wait till we get it all together. Jesus doesn't wait until we overcome our temptation and fight off our demons and conquer our sin. Paul writes, Romans 5.8, God shows His love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In our courtyard, we see guilt. But beyond the courtyard, at the cross, we see grace. And grace means what? We are forgiven. We receive love we don't deserve. Who preaches the sermon at Pentecost? Peter. That sermon converted 3,000 people that day. Who writes two, two books of the New Testament? Peter. Listen closely. Grace doesn't depend on how much we love Jesus. Grace is how much Jesus loves each one of us, just as we need to be loved. Grace doesn't depend on what we do for Jesus. Grace depends on what Jesus does for us. Grace doesn't depend on us giving our life for Jesus. Grace depends on Jesus giving His life for us. See, our story isn't over when Jesus is in it. We can all come back from guilt, no matter what it is. How? Grace. When I hear the words of Jesus say, it is finished, I have this over, it always causes me to stop and pause. At the same time, I have this guilt that I know of, that I'm aware of, and it's part of the reason that Jesus is on the cross. But at the same time, Jesus' love has taken that away. I don't understand it fully. but I am in constant awe of it. Because Jesus hung on that cross for me. And Jesus hung on the cross for each and every one of you. He did that for our sin. He did that for our guilt. And Jesus went to the cross to show us grace. Grace Grace, grace. Amen? Amen? Let us pray. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding be with us all. Amen. At this time, the ushers will come forward and collect the tithes and the offerings.
invite you to please rise as you're able. As God's children, we boldly pray the pay, we boldly pray the prayer our Father taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Onward in Christ, footsteps treading, pilgrims here, our home above, full of faith and hope and love. Let us do the Father's bidding. And so we pray. Gracious Father, we stand in awe and wonder at Your abounding grace, which You have lavished on us through Your Son, Jesus. That's why we celebrate where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Gracious Father, in Peter's failure, we see our own failure in sin. Too often we are spiritually dead, living in the reign of sin and death. But now through Jesus, you make us alive and children of your great affection and grace. We delight to say, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Gracious Father, as lost as we may get in guilt, so much more do you restore us in grace. Amazing, life-changing, overflowing grace. Grace planned for Jesus to be arrested, tried, condemned, crucified, buried, and risen for us. That's why we are eternally grateful. Because where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Indeed, gracious Father, this Gospel shows us how fervently for us you really are. You didn't spare your own Son, but gave him up for all of us. How will you not also, along with Jesus, graciously give us all things? Jesus, let me faithful be. Life eternal grant to me. Amen. Together we say the words of Luther's evening prayer. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all of my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Jesus invites us to walk with him to the high priest's courtyard, a place of great suffering and a place of great love. We will walk with Jesus all the way to the empty tomb and resurrection victory. Let us ever walk with Jesus. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord looks upon you with His favor and He gives you His peace. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> 